this new study by roughly 3 million patients on the recommendation of their doctors. We weren't expecting to see such a high rate of referrals. That was really surprising to us. Dr. Rex Hoffman recommended meditation to his patient, Danilo Ramirez, who had stage 2 lymphoma and was too claustrophobic to endure the treatments, which required wearing this large radiation mask. It worked. It was beautiful that my mind was able to control my heartbeat, my breathing, my relaxation. I see us using more and more of our patients. The awareness of the breath. Researchers say meditation doesn't just relax you, it can physically change your brain. Earlier this year, a Harvard study looked at people who took a mere eight-week course in meditation and found that these two parts of their brains associated with self-awareness and compassion actually grew, while this part associated with stress shrank. There are lots of different kinds of meditation, but the kind most doctors recommend does not involve wearing robes, chanting, lighting incense, or joining a religious group. What it does involve is three very basic steps. Step number one, sit comfortably. Step number two, focus on your breath, feel it going in and out. Step number three, when your mind wanders, which it will a million times, to things like, did I feed the dog, where are my keys, and what am I having for dinner, every time your mind wanders, just gently return to your breath. I've interviewed corporate executives who say meditation has made them more focused and effective. And one rock star who says it cured his stage fright. If I wasn't meditating, if I still had so much stage fright, I might still be in my shell. That's a pretty big change. So those people had the good part of their brain plumped up. How long did they meditate a day? Just 30 minutes a day. And there's some indication that if you do less, it will still work. And there's also all sorts of fascinating studies that show that meditation can reduce your blood pressure, boost your immune system, and even make you nicer. Sir. My wife is encouraging me to try that. Yeah, you look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Meditation. A Franciscan nun. I wasn't expecting that. 
but Fiona's findings were worth further investigation. We sent them to an independent pain researcher at another university who said something had calmed the pain network. And when Fiona says she can feel less pain or is less troubled by the pain, this is matched up. That's right, yes, I would say so. This is quite clear from her images. I knew what it was doing, and I've used it all the time, and it helped me with my pain. But there is something very powerful about knowing there is physical, objective proof that it's working. Scientifically, just two scans doesn't prove much, but it does reflect a wider, growing body of research that suggests mindfulness meditation can help stress, pain, and even self-centeredness. David Silito, BBC News. So you can watch more. There's a lot of video clips and information that relate to meditation, the benefit of doing meditation that we discussed last time. That's, that's funny. Why a monk, a neuroscientist, and a movie star are giving the virus to be just delete? <laughs> okay. It's a famous one. Okay, so uh, let us move back to the uh, lesson today. Okay, let's see. Um, so today we talk about the extended of this uh, dharma. And I told you that I moved this up, uh, chapter three. I mean, the part three up, and the other part of chapter two I move later on so that we can learn in, in the coin, fancy way, fancy way. Okay. So I don't know. Last time I wrote, I don't know whether this is this Ricky or Shiki. Buddha is number one. Buddha Dharma. Body? No? Okay. So what's, you know, Buddha, what's mean Buddha Dharma body? What's mean? Anyone know? Okay, so remember, um, right after the Buddha passed away, right? And there's a, um, a little uh, Brahman, right? He stepped out to divide the Buddha read this into eight portions, remember that? Mm -hmm. And and he uh, and he uh, get to uh, uh, the kings of eight countries uh, proportionally. Um, so that is the job of the lay people. And what, what about the monk or the monastic um, Remember Mahatma Shiva, he gathered five of the monks um, to decide against the Buddha teachings after his Nirvana, uh, three months after his Nirvana. So that's the first uh, Buddhist council we started, right? And that's what we call Buddha Dharma. That's, remember, we talk about why Hindu Buddha appoint anyone to had the Buddhist communities member one against one. Wanted everybody to find their own enlightenment. Yeah, plus, and we will talk about that. About that. It's so important. Um, after this class, you, I think um, you may be able to explain to your friends why Buddhist, Buddhism is so, it doesn't have any, what they call, central authorities. But it's a, a loose organization. Remember we talk about that, right? The thing that makes people corrupt the most are money, right? Power, right? No matter what kind of um, occupations or profession you are, you know, right? So if, if the Buddha appoints someone to replace you as a central authority, like a pope, right? What happens to NATO? Who will work with this one here? Right? Power. Play games with power. And for the Arhat, remember I told you many times that they have to give it up. They have to transform their ego. As a matter they have to have this uh, ego. How could they become enlightened? Make sense? So the most important thing is the Buddha teaching, not with the power, not with the spirit, not with the monastery. Understand that? Not, not with the leadership. Make sense? 
So that's why uh, up to now, Buddhism in, in, in any country uh, is so loose, um, so we don't have any sense of authority. The reason why many people they think the Lama is Buddhist talk, but that's not the case. It goes to us, the most special one in Buddhist communities, but not at all. Because we don't have any center or authority. That's why the Buddha teachings is so important. That's his Dharma. That's his body. Make sense now? Right. So, um, that's the reason why Buddhism is still exists up to now. Otherwise, if we play with the power, like the other one, will be corrupt soon later, right? And uh, that was one. And this is so important. A uh, message, a uh, principle that we uh, set out. Yeah. OK. So yes, number two. I, I see. I see. You want to have them? Yes. System. This kind of language is a classical uh, Indian, uh, Indian classical languages, and their system. You will separate bracket. Remember? Um, okay. So again, uh, Sutta or Sutta is much, much different. Um, and that is in, up to now, is in the Rao tradition. This is in Mahayana. Okay. Um, again, Sutta or Sutta is a set of a collection of the Buddha teachings orally. Um, and plus, on the top, that is some uh, some lecture, some teaching from his close disciple, like uh, Chariputra. Remember, we talk about the two main disciple. Remember that Chariputra. Remember him? Uh, we talk about him briefly, right? So sometimes the Buddha appoint him to give a lecture on behalf of him. Um, but remember, actually, he, he passed away before the Buddha entered Nirvana. So again, um, mostly um, uh, in the Sutta or Sutta collection, uh, the Buddha teach mostly, mm, and some are his close disciple, even some, especially in the Ashura, in the Sutra or sacred collection, is some teaching from Bodhisattva or even some God too. But they are in uh, in according to the uh, Buddha teaching too. Um, so that, that's what the, the collection of Sutra or Sutra. And Vinaya, again, that is uh, the set of rules for the monks and nuns and lay people, how to conduct, how to live um, in the monastery, how to, um, basically that's different rules. And um, it's, it's, it's very similar, not that much different. But only, only the Buddha has, only the, only the Buddha who has authority to, to lay down uh, this set of rules, not other one. 
not his close disciple, as only him. You see the difference, right? And these commentaries, anyone can come in, can make comments, right? Uh, when there's some articles, and then there's a, someone mm, bring some article, right? And other people can write uh, commentaries on that article or, or that book and so forth. Yes. Uh, was it the bandana? Vinaya. Vinaya. Yeah. Why is it that uh, only Buddha can can write those, or you know, why is it that he has the only authorities? What do you think? What do you think? Are they rules? Ah, uh, the rules of monks and nuns specifically. Why? But for the sutra, oh, some of his, um, some of his disciples can, can speak to, but not this one. Why? Why is that? Because he was enlightened already. Yeah. It's <coughs> simple. But why? What? Why, why other one can can speak uh, with for the sutra? Why? Not this one. What is different? What do you think? Because they're talking about his teachings. And they may talk about their experience too, right? Right? Do you understand that? You see the difference? Let, well, let me put it this way. In school, uh, in everywhere, um, let's say in order to build a school, do we need to follow a set of rules? It's pretty complicated. Right? To build the, the school, the hospital, or even the, the house, you have to go to Blend in the department, right, to get approval from them, right? And it's pretty complicated. Have you been construct any house or shared mm -hmm. or, or remodel your house before? Yeah. Right? You go to, you have to go through all process of approval from blending in the department, right? Here in, in New York, um, it's much easier, probably it's much easier than Louisville or Big City. You see that? So in any circumstances, we have some kind of rules or that govern how we act. Make sense? So again, for the, especially for the Buddhist monks and nuns, we see the Buddha had attained enlightenment. He, he set out the rules. And remember, let me mention one more point. He wait until he established or he, yeah, he provide guidelines uh, for the rules of Maoist now, they say that um, 12 years, 12 years after his enlightenment, not right, not right after he accepted the five disciples. You know why? Probably you don't know. 12 years after his enlightenment, and after he had accepted many men, many monks and nuns into this the order. You know why? Most of the time, put this way. He waits for them to make mistake to provide the guidelines. He didn't provide the guidelines right before the end of uh, the, the Sangha. Actually, let me put this way. From the years, from the time of his, uh, from the time that he accepts people into the Sangha, into the 12 years, not many people make mistake because most of them have dedication in the religious faith, in the religious inclination, in, in the religious practice. So they really have that kind of, of uh, interest. So they, don't, they didn't make much mistake. But later on, remember, the Buddha accepted almost everyone. Positive, king, prince, uh, business, uh, officers, and so forth. You understand that? There's a variety of people coming to the Sangha. It's not a mess, but, <laughs> but you know, some people carry their own habitual patterns, you understand that? And they create a mistake. That's why whenever people make mistakes, they establish the rules for them to follow. Let me put it this way. Let me tell you one, one example. The first, uh, uh, the first major, yeah, the first major uh, piece for monks and now it's just for monks. Uh, it's just to come back. <coughs> so most of the research up now we have to uphold this. As much as we this month, you know. This one one story. So from the time that the Buddha attained enlightenment up to the twelve years, he didn't establish any rules. So one day there's one monk. He 
came back to visit his mother. And his mother told him, well, you left me and your wife, so we don't, I don't have any grandson to carry on the, the family traditions. You know, you know in, the, in the past, as I said, in the East, having a son to carry on the family uh, traditions is too important. So why don't you, uh, you sleep with your wife so that at least you provide a son for me, a ransom for me to carry on my, tradition, my family traditions. And after that, you can go back and become a mom again, like don't worry. <laughs> so what happened? Because at that time, the Buddha have not established this half proof yet. So he did. But they went up to them and he went back to, to see the Buddha. He is so regretful. And he, he revealed his mistake to the Buddha. And of course, the Buddha admonished him. And at that time, from that time on, he had established this first rule for monks. No. Make sense now? But before, of course, they know whoever enters this religious order need to know that they need to understand from, from that time. Yeah. So, if there was another Buddha yeah. to come into the picture, mm -hmm. could that Buddha change some of that, those rules? Or uh, could he make more rules, another Buddha? Uh, depend. I think uh, Buddha's will depend. He may do make less and make, make, make more. And even right before the Buddha ended in um, Nirvana or before he passed, when he said, you guys can ignore some minor rules. That's, n that's unnecessary to govern the, the Sangha. But later on, during the first uh, Buddhist, Sangha, Buddhist Council, um, they decided to keep all. Yes. Okay. In the uh, in the uh, Tibetan mm -hmm. canon, there were I discovered there were like okay, as you know, there's thousands of texts of rules and uh -huh. regulations. Uh, I'm trying to figure out with this uh, Vinyana, mm -hmm. Vinyana. How many rules are there? <laughs> Basically, I can say, actually, for monks and nuns, especially if we have, uh, later on we can study, we have um, four major ones, and 13 intermediate ones, and the other minor ones too. And in, and in total, for our Mahayana traditions, we have about 250. How many? 250. 250. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's is for Mahayana. And, and for Therada, they have 227. It's different, it's still the minor one, but the, the, the major ones are the same. Even Thailand, we listen to. As later, we discussed about that. Okay? So you understand, right? So you understand why the Buddha established this type of only for him. He has all, only him who has authorities. Make sense? Right. Okay, again, commentary is so simple, right? Anyone can make a comment. comment. <laughs> To the teaching is whichever. It is simple. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see. Okay. The next one. Who is this? Taylor. Is that right? Is that right? Number three. Yeah. The formation of Pali Canyon. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Please. What do you have there? Yes. Um, I just had that it was pretty much the um, standard collection mm -hmm. of the Theravada Buddhist traditions mm -hmm. and the reason it's called the Pali Canon is because it's written in uh, the Pali language mm -hmm. um, I believe it was written in Sri Lanka yeah. mm -hmm. in like 30, 34, 29, something, somewhere around that yeah. time this this time. Mm. Um, and it, it's in three categories. The this one in two. Yeah, it's three categories. That's all. Yeah, it's all. Okay. Ahead. Okay. Let me go over one more time so you can understand. Right. Now, um, remember? Can you see right? Remember basic. Probably, according to some scholar, probably would I speak, can you see, Mangala, 
Can you see that? Mangala language, or all, 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 all the indigenous uh, languages around this area, where he walked around, he spread his teaching in this northern part of India, right? And remember, I mentioned to you that this one monk asked him whether he, um, uh, they need to preserve the teaching in Sanskrit or not. At that time, that is the oral language uh, for the elite, for the, the high class people, like for the uh, for the priest, uh, for the royal, or priest, not for the select one. Did they mention this? Mm -hmm. But would I say no way? No. You can speak any language, respect my dharma. Don't restrain yourself in one language. Make sense? So the reason why this spreads far, let's put spread far in, in this room and, and other places. Especially after, especially during the Ashoka times, remember? Um, here, here the, um, here remember when he erected the pillars and spread out all the um, in the continents here, and he is bright uh, the word teachings on the pillars, remember? And spread everywhere around India as well as uh, spread to different countries up to the third council. Right? Of course, up to now, um, they, they still debate about um, what type of languages they use when they spread, they, when Ashoka sent the missionary groups to the to the west and to the east, mm -hmm. right? But um, uh, but according to uh, some many scholars, they are read that. Um, remember, um, Ashoka son and daughter Mahinda, the, the prince and princess, they brought the Dharma, they brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Remember, uh, we talked about that, right? Yeah, and uh, son from the forces the second century BC, they start to write out Buddha teaching in Pali. At that page, um, at that page, this is this one here we kept, I kept uh, for, for you to see. This is a famous cave uh, called Brock Temple where they convened um, the Buddhist monks um, to write out the Buddha teachings in, um, in Pali. Remember, Pali is, is the structural, classical languages of Sang of uh, Indian. Uh, that's, they are the sister languages. Yes. So, what's the difference between these languages? Is one is for the elite, the people like the priests and stuff like that, the lower class people. What's the difference in their language? Up to now, in India, there's there are hundreds of languages. Well, of course, most of them they speak in Hindu. And some of them speak English, but they have some dialects, a hundred dialects. And here, during the even the Buddha times, and 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 this went to extend to Ashoka. These are what they call the, the languages of the elites, of the high class people. Of course, the common people they they spoke uh, dialects. It's common sense. Makes sense. It's like in the Middle Ages when um, only the Pope and the Latin priests were allowed to know Latin. Common people spoke whatever yeah, dialects that they had in their yeah. or local dialects, but you weren't allowed to know Latin unless you were a priest or royalty. Like they didn't just teach anybody Latin. Okay, so how could how could they understand what the priest was saying in Latin? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times they didn't. That's why the church had so much control. Uh -huh. They still do that now in Catholic churches. They speak it in Latin sometimes, and you don't know what they're saying. That's why the, that has so much power. If only one group of people have the control of the language, then that's the whole purpose. That's the point. Okay. Well, <laughs> how did I'm trying to figure out how did they communicate different people, different languages? How did they all communicate with so many different languages? Uh -huh. Yeah, so yes, you can say that here. And I told you that um, the Buddha allowed them to speak their own dialect, right? Right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. in, in their local dialects. But when they convened, yes, when they, they have first, second, and third Buddhist council, of course, they use, probably they, they may use the elite language, we don't know. But according to the scholar, they first start to write down the Buddha teaching in Pali. Mm -hmm. 
in the first or second century BCE in Sri Lanka. You make sense? But according to some scholar, the Sanskrit uh, text, the Sanskrit uh, collection, um, has been um, compiled uh, many centuries earlier. Remember during the Ashoka times, he spread, he, he, he spread out, he, he sent his missionary to different countries. Probably according to them, sometimes, some, some scholars they say he could use part of the Sanskrit. And of course, this is the language of the elites, but this is this is the, the we can say that the the common common language for for the Buddha teachings. Okay. Makes sense. But this as well as this Pali language nowadays, let's say if 